Welcome to Just Asia, AHRC TV's weekly human rights program. These are the headlines. Bangladesh sees crackdown against civil society ahead of general elections. Rohingya refugees relieved at Bangladesh postponement of repatriation plan. Indonesian region refuses to obey court orders to issue church permits. Taiwan's referendum on gay rights may end in limitations. Malaysia backtracks on commitment to ratify Conventional Against Racial Discrimination. Welcome to AHRC TV's Just Asia. I'm Alexandra. This week, Just Asia begins with Bangladesh, where the government has intensified crackdowns on civil society actors and independent human rights organizations prior to December's general elections. The crackdown includes character assassinations of dissidents through pro-government media, as well as terrorist attacks on targeted individuals and groups in collaboration with law enforcement agencies. Prominent freedom fighter and civil society actor Dr. Safrullah Choudhury and the institution he established have recently come under a series of such terrorist attacks. Meanwhile, the pro-government media is currently busy maligning Dr. Madhu Alam Majumdar, head of the Hunger Project and Citizen for Good Governance, as well as his two organizations. Human rights group Otakar has long been attacked with similar propaganda, in addition to being implicated in false cybercrime cases. Just Asia speaks to Mohammed Ashraf Usaman of the Asian Human Rights Commission for more details. The civil society actors and human rights activists are facing serious challenges in Bangladesh. As we know that Dr. Zafrullah Choudhury a prominent freedom fighter, highly respected in the country, uh, has been facing fabricated charges. So far, at least half a dozen criminal cases have been filed against Dr. Zafrullah Choudhury and his colleagues. The institutions that he has founded with the help of uh, various uh, actors of the country particularly university uh, uh, medical teaching school uh, and uh, pharmaceuticals institutions to improve the healthcare in the country. Those institutions have faced physical attacks by terrorists and rapid action battalion and also protected the perpetrators are being protected, protected by the government. Then the second case we see that Dr. Badiul Alam Majumda, he is uh, very much prominent for his uh, work as a leader of the organization called Citizens for Good Governance. They mostly research about the electoral process and the flaws in the system uh, for credible fair electoral system and then he also leads the hunger project as the country director. His house came under attack uh, in August when the ambassador of the United States were uh, leaving his house after having a dinner and that attack itself happened in front of the law enforcement agencies uh, by the terrorists. And then now the media is uh, campaigning against these uh, organizations led by Dr. Badiul Alam Majumda, uh, basically accusing them to be uh, corrupted in managing the organizations. Then the third instance uh, we see that Odhika, the independent organization of human rights that have been consistently documenting the human rights cases and issues of the country for uh, more than two decades now have came under massive uh, pro-government newspaper attacks. Uh, it is assassinating characters of Odhika's leaderships, the organization and its human rights activism. So, all these are interconnected to each other and it is a part of the governmental plan uh, centering the election in the lead of the, uh, up of the election the government is trying to discredit the independent organizations and civil society actors who always uh, raise their critical voices and who always try to campaign for the fair play in the country's electoral system 
of unity of the uh, political groups and also improvement and transformation of the rule of law institutions. So, these institutions what the government is destroying uh, very much and also using those institutions against the citizens itself, uh, uh, itself and the um, uh, independent human rights organization and civil society actors. So, the global community now must speak out and stand beside the victims, the independent individuals and the organizations who are facing attacks by the incumbent government of Bangladesh. Next, Rohingya refugees in Bangladesh were relieved after Prime Minister Hasina's government decided to postpone plans to repatriate Rohingya refugees to Burma last week. United Nations officials and international aid agencies praised Bangladesh for upholding a commitment not to force the repatriation when none of the refugees volunteered to go back. Hundreds of thousands of Rohingya Muslims have fled to Bangladesh from Burma's Rakhine state since last year to escape killings and destruction of their villages by the military. Bangladesh Refugee Commission had planned to begin a voluntary repatriation process last week. Fearful of returning home, some people on Bangladesh repatriation list left their shanties and disappeared into other camps. UN Human Rights Chief Michelle Bachelet said recently that reports of ongoing abuses against the Rohingya remaining in Rakhine continue. This includes allegations of killings, disappearances and arbitrary arrests, as well as widespread restrictions on freedom of movement, health and education. There are also concerns of other exodus of refugees from Burma. A group of 106 persons were arrested after their boat drift to shore last Friday morning in Khao Tan Townships, south of Yangon. According to one of the detainees, they were on their way to Malaysia, but turned back because of the lack of supplies. One woman had already died of hunger. Another boat believed to be carrying Rohingya refugees was sighted Friday near Indonesia. Moving to Indonesia, for over six years, the Congregation of Philadelphia Church of Pekasi Regency, West Java Province, has been conducting a worship service in front of the Presidential Palace every Monday afternoon. The service is to protest against the local government of Pekasi Regency, which is refusing to issue an official permit for the congregation to continue the development of the church. In the meantime, anti-tolerant groups continue to prohibit congregants from entering the church. Not only is this contrary to the Indonesian government's commitment to protect citizens' rights, but it also goes against the 2009 orders of the Administration Court and Supreme Court to issue the permit. The Pekasi region refuses to obey the court orders and instead suggests the church location be changed. This is a serious violation of the rule of law. Civil society is calling upon the central government of Indonesia to intervene and ensure that all citizens are equal before law, and that all religions can exercise their rights without restriction. Next, Taiwan is holding a series of referendum on gay rights on Saturday, which may restrict the rights of homosexual couples to wed. In a landmark ruling in May 2017, Taiwan's constitutional court said that the same-sex couple have the right to be legally married. The court gave the island's legislature two years to legalize gay marriage, but said homosexual partners can be married from May 2019, even if the law has not been formally amended. Many couples have been eagerly awaiting the date. However, if conservative forces win out in the November 24th referendum, activists are worried that gay couples may end up with limited rights. Recent polls show a majority of people are against same-sex marriage. A survey by the Taiwanese Public Opinion Foundation showed as many as 77% of respondents agree that the civil code should limit permanent unions to those between a man and a woman. Social attitudes regarding same-sex education in schools are also conservative. Malaysia is backtracking on ratifying the International Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Racial Discrimination. 
Malay and Muslim groups, as well as the political oppositions, are all against the ratification. The convention would require Malaysia to enact legislation prohibiting racial discriminations and related acts. This could affect Malaysia's long-standing Pumi Putera policy that reserves education and jobs for Malays and other indigenous races, as well as the primacy of Islam and the special positions of the nine royal houses. The oppositions are planning a huge demonstration on December 8th in the capital Kuala Lumpur to protest the ratification. On Sunday, Prime Minister Mahathir Mohamad said he understood that this matter was sensitive to Malays and that it would be almost impossible to amend the constitution to accommodate the convention. He was referring to needing a two-third majority in parliament in order to change the constitution. Earlier in September, Prime Minister Mahathir had said to the UN General Assembly that Malaysia would ratify all remaining international treaties. That is all for this episode of Just Asia. For more on this and other issues, please visit www.humanrights.asia or www.alrc.asia. Thank you for watching and see you next week.